So this morning, Ning has, give, has given a quite nice introduction of the big picture of this work here. And, today, and uh, for this talk, I'm going to give you more detailed descriptions. And uh, this is the outline of my talk. First, I will give you an introduction of the file size errors in general. Then I will move on to the main topic of today, that is the file size errors in fork exchange and MP2 energy calculations. In these two cases, the, their file size errors can be rewritten as a numerical quadrature problem. So, and from this numerical quadrature problem, here are two main topics that I want to share with you today. So the first one is this quadrature error due to zero momentum transfer point. And then I will show you how we can reduce this part of the file size error using our recently proposed stagger mesh method. And the second topic will be a mathematical estimate of the file size errors in both exchange and MP2 energy calculations. So let's begin with a general introduction. We consider an ideal periodic system where you have infinite number of nuclei ions that are positioned in the host space periodically with respect to a unicell omega. And we denote its first abelian zone omega uh, in the reciprocal space as omega star. So such a system has infinite number of electrons. So basically you cannot construct your Hamiltonian directly for the whole system. The standard mean field calculation for such a system is the so-called k-point method, where you sample a uniform, uh, a Mankos pack mesh, basically a uniform mesh, capital K, of size n inside your first brilliant zone omega star in the reciprocal space. So here is a 2D illustration. And then you construct your model Hamiltonian on this uniform k-point mesh and solve it for your orbitals and orbital energies. These orbitals and orbital energies are characterized by two indices. One is the band indices n, and the other one is the momentum vector k on this uniform k-point mesh. So for those of you who are not quite familiar with the k-point method, here is another equivalent description in the real space, the so-called supercell model. So what you do is to pick a big supercell that contains, say, n number of unicells. Say this one here. Then you enforce a periodic boundary condition on this supercell. In this setting, you can construct your model Hamiltonian only for the electrons inside this supercell. And then you solve it for your orbitals and orbital energies. Based on this well-known block decomposition theory, we can show that this supercell model here is exactly equivalent to this k-point calculation I just showed you earlier. The only difference is that the supercell model is defined in the real space with n unicells. The equivalent k-point method in the reciprocal space is, defi is defined in the first abelian zone with a k-point mesh of the same size. So when you expand your supercell in the real space, it corresponds to densifying your uniform k-point mesh in the reciprocal space here. And then with such a mean field calculation, you can do all types of electronic structure calculations just in a similar way as in the molecular case. For example, you can compute your electron density by summing over the square of all the occupied orbitals. And similarly, you can compute your exchange or MP2 energy per unit cell with this extra averaging factor 1 over n in each formula here. So, however, for all the calculations, they look fine, and, uh, there, but there is always a key problem that underlies beliefs all these calculations. That is, the model Hamiltonian you construct with a finite k-point mesh, or equivalently, with a finite supercell, the, it only approximately describes this ideal infinite-sized periodic system. This point can be easily understood from a supercell viewpoint. That is, in the supercell model, you enforce a periodic boundary condition, which requires the electrons outside your supercell to share the same relative positions as the corresponding electrons inside the supercell. So this actually creates artificial correlations. So this model Hamiltonian with a finite k-point mesh is always an approximation. And in order to 
describe this, uh, in order to describe this periodic system exactly, what you need to do in the real space is just to expand your supercell to the whole real space to enclose all the electrons in your system. Or correspondingly, in the reciprocal space, it, you need to densify your uniform k-point mesh to fill up the whole first abelian lone omega star. And this limit here is called the thermodynamic limit. And as a, as a result of this fact that this model Hamiltonian is always an approximation, all your calculations based on this model Hamiltonian are also only approximations, and will converge to the corresponding exact values that you actually want to compute only when you take to the thermodynamic limit. So here is a simple example of the exchange energy calculation for 3D diamond system under a, using a minimal basis set. So as you can see, when we gradually increase the k-point mesh size, or basically the supercell size, the computed exchange energy here per unit cell will gradually converge to the thermodynamic limit result, which is indicated by this black horizontal line here. And one important observation is that, as you can see with a finite k-point mesh, there is always a significant difference, at least in this case, between the exchange energy you compute with a finite k-point mesh and the one in the thermodynamic limit. This difference here is called the finite size error that we care about. And, uh, and the finite size error is always caused by this intrinsic fact that our model Hamiltonian is only an approximation. As a result, finite size errors exist in, many, in all types of calculations. Here are some more examples for the same system, for the Diamond system. So you have MP2 perturbation energy calculation, you have RPA correlation energy calculation, and the last one here is an intermediate quantity you have to compute in a G0, W0 calculation the diagonal entries of your self-energy operators. So in practice, on one side, we want to compute a specific quantity in the thermodynamic limit, the exact values we want to compute. But meanwhile, due to the finite computational resource we have, we are only be able to do the calculation using a finite k-point mesh. So it is important for us to understand the finite size error, the difference between these two, so that we may be able to to get some to do some post process to get a better estimate of the thermodynamic limit result based on our finite calculations. And in practice, there are two main problems that we care about. The first one is that for a specific calculation, say exchange MP2 RPA, how fast does the corresponding finite size error decay with respect to the k point mesh size? Because this is of practical importance, because in practice, what people usually do is to do this specific calculation using several meshes of different sizes. So you can get this red curve here, and then you do a power law extrapolation to get an estimate of the thermodynamic limit. And the power law here used here exactly corresponds to the decay rate of the finite size error in your calculation. So knowing the exact decay rate for your calculation is critical for you to use the correct power law extrapolation in your calculation. So, and one interesting observation or one interesting note is that for different calculations, the decay rate of your finite size error are different. So we can actually show that for MP2 energy calculation and RPA energy calculation for insulating system, the finite size errors decay in a rate of 1 over n. But for exchange energy calculation and the self-energy diagonal entries, they have their finite size errors to decay in a rate of 1 over n to 1 third. So it's much slower in these other two cases. So basically, it just says that for each specific calculation, you have to analyze its finite size errors separately. There is no universal rule of thumb to determine how fast the finite size error decays. And the second problem is, the second more practical problem is that while we are only able to do a calculation using a finite k-point mesh, how can we reduce the finite size error? People have developed many methods to reduce the finite size error for different types of calculations. 
the most general one is the power law extrapolation, as I've showed you. And the another one is the modern constant correction that is commonly used to reduce the finite size error in exchange energy calculations. And there are more complicated ones like uh, structure factor interpolation, twist averaging, head wind correction, and so on for all types of calculations. So for, a for the last part of the introduction, I would like to show you an example here to show, to show you how important it is for you to have a good finite size correction or the correction to the finite size errors in practice. So this is a plot for modern constant correction to the exchange energy calculation. As you can see, this blue curve corresponds to the modern constant correction. It converges to the same thermodynamic limit result, but much faster. And uh, it just basically says that if you are able to find a good correction to your finite size error in your specific calculation, you would be able to work with a relatively much smaller k-point mesh or relatively much smaller system while getting the same or even better accuracy for your calculation. As a result, you will get a significant savings in terms of both computation and storage cost. So this finishes the introduction of the file size error in general. And uh, next, I will move on to, these two, to focus on these two problems over two specific calculations, the exchange energy and the MP2 energy calculation. Yeah. I just want to make a remark. There's another reason mm -hmm. that you want to work with small n. Suppose you're, you're doing a liquid, yeah. uh, a quantum mechanical liquid. It says has 100 atoms. You can't really do an extrapolation because the liquid with 1,000 atoms is completely different. Yeah. Or another example we run into is suppose your unit cell has 100 atoms in the unit cell. Oh, yeah. The next unit cell would have 800 atoms. Yeah, that's true. And it's really better to correct 100 atoms yeah. and not have to do the larger system. Yeah, that is in that case, like sometimes basically you just can only get maybe two data points in this curve, right? right. And then you cannot do any power extrapolations. So it's better to have a method where you can just do one system. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, thanks for your comment. Yeah. So next I will just uh, move on to, the, to these two problems over two particular calculations, the, the exchange energy and MP2 energy calculations. Oh. So first uh, I will talk about how we can rewrite the finite size errors in these two specific calculations into a numerical quadrature form. So here is a list of the calculations, the electron density exchange and MP2 using a finite k-point mesh. The capital K here, you sample momentum vectors ki, kj, ka on this k-point mesh. And I will start with the simplest example, the electron density, to introduce this reformulation. So we have the well-known block decomposition for the, or, for the orbitals. What we can do is we do some simple rewriting. So we have this one square of nk in the orbitals, so we can take it out. We have one over nk. Meanwhile, we will multiply and also divide this constant, the volume of the first brilliant of the omega star, outside and inside this bracket. And then this bracketed term here all together can be treated as a function of the momentum vector ki, where ki is summed over this uniform mesh, capital K. So in this way, we can write it as in this more concise form here. One important thing to note is that this prefactor, omega star, divided by n, is exactly the volume of each small cubic domain here defined by this uniform mesh. So this prefactor combined with this summation here exactly corresponds to a triploidal quadrature operator. So uh, here I will always fix the position vector r. So you, can, you only treat it as a function of k. So in the thermodynamic limit, when you densify your uniform mesh to fill up the whole first brilliant omega star, this triploidal quadrature will simply converge to the corresponding integral operators. In this way, we can get an explicit representation of the electron density in the thermodynamic limit as an integral over the momentum vector k in the first brilliant omega star. And we care about the finite size error, meaning the difference between the integral and the triploidal quadrature calculation. 
Uh, one thing to note is that I'm using F tutor in the finite case, but F in the thermodynamic limit case. This is because there is also finite size errors in your computed orbitals, say U here or the phi here. So F tutor will only converge to the exact F in the thermodynamic limit. So similar formulation can also be applied to the more complicated calculations, say the exchange energy calculation. Here, we will sum over a pair of occupied orbitals in the calculation. So we have a double summation over Ki and Kj on this uniform mesh. And in the calculation of the Ri, we'll get an extra 1 over n factor out. So we have 1 over n square. So ultimately, we can reformulate the calculation into a triploidal quadrature calculation with respect to mom two momentum vectors, Ki and Kj. In the thermodynamic limit, it converges to a double integral. And we care about the final size error here. The same applies to MP2. The only difference is that now we have a triploidal quadrature over three momentum vectors, Ki, Kj, Ka. And we have a triple integral in the thermodynamic limit. So from this description, you can easily see the pattern. That is, with a finite k-point mesh, all these three calculations here correspond to some triploidal quadrature calculations with the momentum vectors sampled on this k-point mesh you use for your model Hamiltonian. And these quadratures are used to approximate the corresponding exact integrals in the thermodynamic limit. So from this perspective, it is quite natural to split the finite size zero into two parts. One is the evaluation error of the integrands, meaning the difference between f tilde and f in these cases, which can come from the finite size errors in your computed orbitals and orbital energies. It can also come from the basis set in complete list. So in the rest of this talk, I will always assume that we know the f tilde exactly. Basically, we assume that we know the exact orbitals and orbital energies, and there is no basis errors from basis set in complete list. So with this assumption, the remaining finite size error is exactly the quadrature error of the triploidal rule you use here meaning the difference between the integral and the triploidal quadrature calculation you use to approximate the integral. In this way, this problem becomes a quite standard numerical analysis problem. And our goal is just to try to analyze the quadrature error and try to understand it to, you, to develop new method to reduce the quadrature error in this specific electronic structure calculation setting. And uh, Particularly, in the rest of this talk, I will focus on this quadrature error from two perspectives. One is the singular quadrature load, meaning these quadrature points where the function, the defined function here, is not well-defined or is singular. And it turns out that these singular quadrature loads will contribute significant quadrature errors or finite size errors. And the second focus will be a mathematical uh, estimate of the magnitude of the finite quadrature errors in these two cases. And to our best knowledge, this should be the first rigorous description of the quadrature errors from a numerical quadrature perspective. So I'll move on to the first focus here, the singular quadrature load. Specifically, in the exchange and MPT calculation, these singular quadrature loads are exactly the zero momentum transfer points. Uh, I'll start with a simple example. We consider this simple 1D function, which is singular at x equals 0. In our numerical quadrature calculation, what would happen is that if you have x equals 0 to be one of your quadrature load, the numerical calculation, what you, we, we usually do, is to simply set the function value to be 0 at this x equals 0 point because we basically do not know how to evaluate. And the setting the function value to be zero here exactly corresponds to neglecting the integral of this function inside this small interval that contains x equals zero. And this neglected integral here will always contribute as a quadrature error, which turns out to be significant in this simple case. This is sometimes we call it the punctured triploidal rule, because we basically give up approximating the integral inside this small inter interval here, because we do not know how to evaluate f0. 
And the punctured triploidal rule indeed appears in both exchange and MP2 energy calculations. Here, let's take a look at the exchange energy first. This is the exchange energy calculation. We first introduce a simple change of variables by replacing kj by ki plus q. So q here is commonly referred to as the momentum transfer of this ERI term, ki, ij, ji. So with this change of variable, this momentum transfer vector q is equivalently sampled on another uniform mesh, capital KQ. Capital KQ is of the same size as your original uniform mesh, capital K, but meanwhile, it always contains Q equals zero here. This is because you sample your both Ki and Kj on the same mesh. So when Ki equals Kj, you get this zero momentum transfer point, Q equals zero. Using the same change of variable, we can easily reformulate the quadrature calculation here into the one over Ki and momentum transfer vector Q. So we focus on the quadrature error with this new reformulation. And uh, the key problem here is just what I mentioned earlier. The uniform mesh for your momentum transfer vector Q always contains Q equals zero, the zero momentum transfer point. It turns out that this point is exactly a singular quadrature load for this exchange energy calculation. Because if we take a look at this integrand f here, it exactly corresponds to the summations of these ZRIs. You, you expand it, you'll find that the momentum transfer vector q, kj minus ki, exactly shows up in the denominator of your Coulomb curl, 4 pi over q plus g squared. So with the term g equals zero, you can find that this term here, basically with g equals zero, is singular at q equals zero. In the numerical quadrature calculation, you will set the whole term to be zero when you come across with q equals zero. This is just a, basically in the evaluation of the ERIs, this prime summation will set this singular term to be zero at q equals zero. And from a punctured triploidal rule perspective, it basically says that we will always neglect the integral of this singular term inside this small cubic domain omega star lot that contains q equals zero. This neglected integral contributes as a quadrature error and can be estimated to be of scale n to negative one third, which turns out to be a significant quadrature error for the whole calculation. So a, bit, a, a more intuitive summary just like uh, the evaluations of these ERIs with zero momentum transfer point q equals zero alone will contribute a significant quadrature error of scale n to negative one third. Similar analysis can also be applied to MP2, simply more complicated. I just uh, use a direct term as one example. So we have IJAB and ABIJ. In this case, for the first ERI, the momentum transfer Q is defined as KA minus KI. We can check the evaluation of this ERI. We can find that at Q equals zero, we will also neglect a similar singular term, 4 pi over Q squared times this two pair product, in our numerical quadrature calculation. And so is the second ERI here. So overall, we also got a punctured triploidal rule for that singular term, which corresponds to neglecting the integral of this singular term, which is of scale O1, inside this small cubic domain omega star lot. This neglected integral here can be estimated to be of scale 1 over n, which is a significant contribution in the MP2 energy calculations. Hopefully, I've convinced you that uh, this single point, q equals 0, is a troublemaker. And next, I will try to present you our recently proposed stagger mesh method that can avoid, that can elegantly avoid this quadrature error due to q equals 0. The idea is quite straightforward from a numerical quadrature perspective, just one slide here. So take this MP2 direct term as one example. Ultimately, our goal is to estimate, is to compute this integral. And in the standard MP2 calculation, we use a triploidal quadrature rule with the uniform mesh for the momentum transfer, transfer vector Q here to happen to always have the Q equals zero point, which is a troublemaker. However, from a numerical quadrature perspective, 
In order to approximate this integral, we actually have this freedom to choose arbitrary uniform meshes for each of these variables, ki, kj, q. We do not have to stick to this specific uniform mesh. So from this perspective, the idea is quite simple. Since q equals 0 is not wanted, let's just choose a uniform mesh, capital KQ, that does not contain q equals 0. And then the problem solved. At least we removed the quadrature error due to q equals 0 alone. Specifically, we will choose this uniform mesh, capital KQ, to be a half mesh size shift of the original gamma centered uniform mesh. So from the left one, the old one, to this new one, that does not contain q equals 0. So using this new mesh in this trapezoidal quadrature calculation just defines the stagger mesh method for this calculation. And here, let's take a look at the exchange. The momentum transfer vector q in exchange energy calculation is defined as kj minus ki. So sampling q on this new mesh that does not contain q equals 0 exactly corresponds to sampling kj and ki on two different and staggered uniform meshes, see this red one and this green one, that are separated by half mesh size shift. So in this way, we get the, yeah, question. So uh, with the staggered mesh, once you do that, wouldn't you need basically a shifted set of block functions to evaluate the integrand itself? Yes, that means that's you correct. you sort of need to diagonalize twice at a different set of block functions, is that correct or not? You mean, we, like, uh, if I understand right, we, uh, the question is about uh, we need to compute the orbitals on both meshes. Yes, that's true. Yes, on one side, there are two solutions. One is just that you directly work on a much larger mesh, use two sub meshes to do the calculation. Another one is what we do usually is just to do the mean field calculation on one mesh, and then fix the effective potential you obtained, and do a long SF non-self-consistent calculation to obtain the orbitals on another mesh. Yeah. Uh, so this is a stagger mesh method for exchange energy calculation. It's a simple modification. You basically only sample Ki on one mesh for this first orbital, first occupied orbital, and Kj on another mesh. That is the only change we need to make. And the same for MP2. The momentum transfers Q inside the, all these ERIs in MP2 calculation always correspond to the difference between some occupied and the virtual momentum vectors, say Ka minus Ki or Kj minus Ka. So sampling Q on this new uniform mesh exactly corresponds to sampling the occupied and the virtual momentum vectors on two staggered meshes. So this red one and this green one. And in this way, we get the stagger mesh method for MP2 calculation. Still a simple modification here, but of course requires more computation to get the corresponding orbitals and other energies. Yes. So what if I use just a midpoint rule rather than trapezoidal rule? Pardon? If I use a midpoint rule? Mean field? Midpoint rule. Oh. How different it? Oh, I would say these two are equivalent because here we are dealing with periodic functions. So. I, I would say it is not mathematically rigorous to call it a trapezoidal rule if we consider the 1D case. Because this, is, this actually corresponds to a midpoint rule, right? Yeah. If you take two points, it's not trapezoidal rule. Mm -hmm. so yeah. If you want to take like, the middle point, uh, this one? Yeah, well, probably on the right. On the right? Yeah. This way. Oh, these are for two different momentum vectors. Yeah. But for this one, because we, we are dealing with periodic functions, so you, all, you can always move your integration domain a little bit so that this point can lie on the boundary, on the edge, on the vertex of a small cubic domain. So that's why like, people just use a, use a trapezoidal rule to, to describe such a quadrature calculation in general. Yeah. OK. Thanks for the question here. So this is MP2 calculation using stagger mesh method. And uh, I'll show you some numerical results. Here is the MP2 calculation 
for both hydrogen dimer and diamond system under quasi 1D, quasi 2D, and 3D settings with a minimal basis set. For the quasi 1D and quasi 2D settings, I will still assume the periodic boundary condition, but only as we find the k-point mesh sampling in one in the corresponding periodic directions, the 1D case, 2D case. Mini H2s, is that right? Mm. Say H2. Yeah. You don't mean a single molecule. You mean a whole chain? A whole chain. But uh, it's just a toy, toy, toy problem that uh, I just replicate the same unicell in 3D or 2D or 1D. Yeah. It is not a physical one. So the blue curve here is the stagger mesh method, and the red one is standard calculation. So here are two main observations. First is that for both quasit 1D system here, a uh, stagger mesh method always outperforms the standard one significantly. However, the second observation is that for quasit 2D and 3D case, stagger mesh method only outperforms for the diamond system, but not for the hydrogen dimer system. And these two observations are actually quite more general. That is, the stagger mesh method can out for MP2 can outperform the standard calculation for all the quasi 1D system, but only for certain quasi 2D and 3D system with high symmetries, see the diamond compared to the hydrogen dimer. We have some more mathematical explanations about why this is the case, and we also have mathematical descriptions about what quasi 2D and 3D systems will benefit from the stagger mesh method, but uh, I will not show you here. But meanwhile, I would say there are still potentials to further improve the stagger mesh method due to this second fact here. And the second remark about this method is that it can also be generalized to higher order perturbation energy calculations as well. Specifically, what we have done is to generalize it to RPA correlation calculations. Here are the numerical results for RPA calculations in the same test setting. As you can see, the numerical performance is quite similar as in the MP2 case. And the last remark is that, as you, have, you may have noticed, I didn't show you any numerical tests over exchange energy calculations, because we can show that the stagger mesh method cannot reduce the quadrature error asymptotically for the exchange energy case. There are mathematical explanations about why, and we also propose the solutions to, do, to address this problem. And uh, yeah. And this finishes the, sec the first part, first focus, first topic about the quadrature error here. So, any questions so far? Okay. So, lastly, I will talk about a mathematical estimate of the quadrature errors in both exchange and MP2 energy calculations. And here are the results before any analysis. So, what I showed you, Lin also showed this table this morning. I'll go over more details. What we have proved is that the standard calculation for exchange and MP2 have quadrature errors of scale n to negative one third and n to negative one. If you add this well-known modern constant correction to your exchange energy calculation, the quadrature error is reduced to one over n. And you may have noticed that maybe like the quadrature error here for standard calculation are exactly of the same scale as the quadrature error due to zero momentum transfer I showed you earlier. And uh, that is indeed the case, but you may wonder whether the singular quadrature load Q equals zero is a single source of the quadrature error here, but or not, the answer is no. Otherwise, the, the analysis can be quite easy. The, uh, the, it turns out that our analysis can show that there is another source of significant dominating quadrature error that comes from all these integration small volume, small domains near Q equals zero. So in other words, e even if you manage to remove the quadrature error due to Q equals zero alone, you still cannot reduce your quadrature error asymptotically in general, which is the case for stagger mesh method in general system. It indeed removes a big chunk of the quadrature error, but it cannot reduce it asymptotically. However, for some special systems with high symmetries, say diamond compared to hydrogen dimer, the second error source here it can be negligible, can become negligible. In that case, the stagger mesh method can significantly reduce the quadrature error from n to negative one 
to n to negative 5 thirds. However, for exchange without Madelon constant correction, you cannot do it. And here are similar results for Cauchy 2D and 1D case. For Cauchy 2D case, the results here are quite similar as in the 3D case. But for Cauchy 1D case, we can show that the stagger mesh method always reduces the quadratic error significantly to, to be super algebraically decaying, basically faster than power, an arbitrary power of 1 over n. Uh, due, to the t due to the limit of time, I will only talk about the analysis for the standard calculations. For those of you who are interested in the, in the more, more detailed analysis, uh, just uh, maybe refer to, the, refer to the papers we wrote, and I will also list the paper in the end of this talk. So let's start with the more mathematical part, the analysis. I will still use the simplest example to introduce all the techniques. Here, the electron density. So this is a quadrature <coughs> error or for the electron density calculation, assuming that we know the function f exactly, or basically the orbitals exactly. It turns out that in the numerical quadrature com community, it is well known that the magnitude of your quadrature error of a trapezoidal rule mainly depends on the boundary conditions and also the smoothness conditions of your target integrand function. And uh, back to the electron density case, we can show that the target integrand function f here, in the, defined by this electron density calculation, is both periodic and smooth with respect to the momentum vector k. It turns out that this is the ideal case for the application of your trapezoidal quadrature rule. Because according to this standard euler maclaurin formula, it just says if your integrand function is both periodic and smooth with respect to your integration domain, then the quadrature error will decay super algebraically. M here is the number of grid points along each dimension for arbitrary L here. So this, this coronary here basically says that the quadrature error in your electron density calculation will decay super algebraically. Basically, you can treat it as exponential decay. So it, be, it, is quite, it is negligible as long as you work with a sufficiently large mesh. Or in other words, it just says that the finite size error in your electron density calculation mainly comes from your finite size errors in the computed orbitals and orbital, uh, only orbitals, yeah. However, this is not the case anymore in both Fock exchange and MP2 energy calculation due to the loss of smoothness. Here is a Fock exchange calculation. If we take a look at the target integral function f here, basically these are, it, it is these uh, ERI summations. We expand it and we can see that, we can actually show that this target integral function f here is smooth and periodic with respect to the first momentum vector ki. See, ki appears in this pair product. So the euler macron formula says that the quadrature error, well, quadrature error over the momentum vector ki part will decay super fast and can be negligible. And uh, meanwhile, the main problem appears for the, in the integration over the momentum transfer vector q. That is, it is indeed periodic with respect to momentum vector Q, momentum transfer Q, but it is discontinuous at Q equals zero due to this Coulomb singularity. As a result, due to this discontinuity here, if you directly apply a standard euler macron formula for the trapezoidal quadrature over momentum transfer vector Q, it will just predict that your trapezoidal quadrature calculation will diverge. You won't get, be able to get to the correct integral in the end. But this is indeed not the case. And the main technical challenge is that we just need to get a more, a tighter estimate of the quadrature error for, the new, for integrating over the momentum transfer vector Q, which is not smooth but periodic. It turns out that the key component that will determine the dominant dominate uh, the dominant quadrature error in this trapezoidal quadrature calculation is the asymptotic long smooth behavior of your target function 
near the singular point q equals zero. So here is a calculation that we need to do. That is, we split the summation over g here into two parts, g not equal to zero and g equals zero. So for the second part here, near q equals zero, it is always smooth with respect to q because you won't get zero denominator. And the singularity only comes from the first term, or the long smoothness comes from the first term. We can do a further simple Taylor expansion where we can find that the zeroth order term is a constant, the number of occupied band. And we get a second order term, a fourth order term, and so on. The first order and the third order terms here can be canceled using the inverse symmetry of your numerical quadrature calculation. And basically, this calculation here says that your target integrand, fun calculation, integrand function here behaves as 1 over q squared and uh, some monomial of q divided by q squared with a monomial degree alpha here to be, to be 2 and 4 and so on. These are the asymptotic long smooth behaviors of the calculation. And without showing you any technical details, what we do next is to obtain a theoretical estimate of the quadrature error for such periodic functions with, with these non-smooth lists. And here is the main result we get. It just says that for generic function f, this is a simplified version, and Lin showed a more complicated one this morning, but this is a simplified version. So for an integral function f, if it is periodic and smooth everywhere, except at x equals zero, where it has this singularity of form of this fractional form x alpha divided by x to the piece power. Then we see that the quadrature, the quadrature error of a triploidal rule for such a function has is of scale one over m to d plus alpha minus p. Here m is the number of grid points along each dimension, so and d is the integration domain. So m to the d power is exactly the number of Grid points you use. Yeah, questions. Okay. So m to the dis power is exactly the number of grid points, and the alpha minus p here basically it denotes the overall degree of this fractional term. As a direct application of this theoretical result, let's take a look at Fock exchange. The leading non-smooth term is one over q squared, which corresponds to alpha minus p to be negative two. So then we check this quadrature error, we can see that this theoretical result says that the quadrature error due to 1 over q squared is of scale 1 to m, 1 to m, because d equals 3, 3 minus 2. So 1 over m is exactly 1 over n to 1 third. And similarly, we can show that the quadrature error due to the second needing non-smooth term here, q squared over q squared, is of scale 1 over n, and so on for the next term. And for those of you who are familiar with the modern constant correction, it exactly corresponds to a quite classical numerical quadratures method called the singularity subtraction. And modern constant correction exactly removes this leading non-smooth term. As a result, the quadrature error after the correction exactly comes from the second leading non-smooth term here and is of scale 1 over n. And uh, similar analysis can be applied to MP2, still just more complicated. So I'll just uh, briefly mention it. We have two ERIs in this direct term. And if we look, take a look at the first ERI here, IJAB, it has singular terms of form 4 pi over q squared times these terms. And we do similar calculations and see that there, the, it behaves as q alpha divided by q squared, with a monomial degree alpha goes from 2 and 4 and so on. There is no 1 over q squared term in the MP2 calculation due to the orthogonality of occupied and virtual orbitals. And if we, product, uh, if we multiply these two ERIs, then we will get two forms of long smoothness. One is a q alpha divided by q squared from one ERI. Another one is a q alpha divided by q fourth from the product of long smooth terms from both ERIs. And uh, we can still apply the same theoretical result and see that the quadrature error from these long smooth terms should be of scale 1 over n and 1 over n to 5 thirds, and so on. And uh, yeah, that, this, is, this is the main analysis we did before. 
And uh, here is a general summary of, of this whole process. Basically, we mainly focus on the, this, the long smoothness in all these calculations. So in focus change, we have IJGI. We can see that the non smoothness is of form 1 over Q squared. And we get a conclusion that quadratic error is n to negative 1 third. For MP2 direct term, each of these ERIs contribute long smooth terms of form Q squared divided by Q squared. So because these two have momentum transfers to be Q and negative Q. So to, you multiply them together, you get two forms of long smoothness. And we prove, we estimate a quadratic error for these long smoothness terms. For MP2 exchange, it is slightly more complicated because with these two ERIs, IJAB and ABJI, will have two independent momentum transfer vectors, which I denote as Q1 and Q2. So when you multiply them together, you get two forms of, uh, three forms of long smoothness at either Q1 equals zero or Q2 equals zero. Our generalized version of this theoretical result still can still handle these long smoothness terms and say that the quadrature error is still of scale n to negative one. So lastly, a conclusion of my talk. First is that the numerical quadrature analysis I just showed you can be generalized to all these finite order perturbation energies. Uh, oh, but the one that I forgot to mention earlier is that such analysis for perturbation energy calculations, including MP2, will only work for insulating systems that has a direct band gap. Because otherwise, there will be extra discontinuities from this orbital energy different fractional terms. Or because in some time, uh, I think for metallic system, usually those finite order perturbation energy calculations simply diverge. And uh, overall, we, we think that this numerical quadrature interpretation of the finite size errors is a quite powerful tool, and uh, we think we hope that it can be further generalized to the calculations to the to interpret and also to address the finite size errors in say, all the finite order perturbation energy calculations (MPN) or the energy calculations for metallic system, where the so where the finite size errors are more complicated. You also need to deal with the occupation number profiles and stuff like that, and also. GW calculations where the singularity comes from the screened Coulomb curl, and many more possible generalizations. So lastly, for this uh, quite lengthy talk, I will give you some takeaways from it. And the first one is that the Coulomb singularities in all these ERI calculations plays a key role that needs to significant finite size errors in all types of energy calculations if you use fun uh, wave function based uh, calculations. And the second is that when you come across with significant finite size errors in your calculations that happens to have calculation of this average summation form, it might be a good idea to try to understand the finite size error from a numerical quadrature inter interpretation. And the key is to understand the long smoothness behavior of your calculations. And lastly, I would say there are many well-developed uh, numerical quadrature tools for singular functions in the numerical quadrature community. So I think it will also be a quite interesting in direction to try to explore all these existing tools for us to develop new methods to reduce the file size errors in all types of calculations. For example, I think we've keep discussing about it that how about using a Gaussian quadrature for this special Singular, singular forms, so Q squared over Q squared. Yeah, is it like that? Okay, and uh, that is all my, that is the presentation today. Thank you.